Well, good evening, Mount Pleasant. Uh, it's good to be here with you uh, this Wednesday night. Thank you uh, for tuning in. So, uh, as you know, we've been going through the Psalms, and that's where we'll be uh, tonight. We'll be in Psalm uh, 38. So, if you want to be flipping over there when we're uh, while we're introducing, uh, just go ahead and and flip over uh, Psalm 38. So, we're nearing the end of 2020, and y'all are probably all happy uh, about that. But as we as we look uh, or as we go towards the end of the year, uh, w- regardless of what year it may be, uh, we usually take a little bit of time to uh, to reflect back on our personal lives. Um, you may not want to look back at all, uh, and that's uh, that's acceptable. Um, but but you know what I mean. Typically, we we like to reflect on on what the past year uh, has been or has done for us, and what we have done, how we've grown, things like that. Uh, so you know maybe some things really went your way um you know maybe you experienced some good personal growth in your christian walk um but usually with the good um there's also some regrets uh whether that be you know missed opportunities or bad decisions or or sin or or a lack of personal growth whatever it may be um so so there's always good with with bad but uh, but what i want to look tonight at uh is this idea of looking back of remembering of 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 personal sin. Um, this is where what David is dealing with here in Psalm 38, and, and maybe that's where you are here at the end of of 2020. Maybe you're in that place right now where uh, you have some besetting sin in your your life, where you're really struggling with it, or or perhaps you're dealing with the consequences of sin right now uh, in your life. And that's where David is in Psalm 38. Uh, you know, maybe you're stuck in shame or guilt, and you're you're really wondering where to go with it, what to do uh, with it. Maybe you want to run to God, but you're you're kind of unsure about whether or not uh, He wants you to come to Him. Uh, we'll we'll answer all of these these questions tonight, and all, and all of these thoughts, all of these questions, um, whether we like to admit it or not, uh, at some point or other, they they creep into our minds when we sin. Uh, you know, sin is certainly not, and dealing with the consequences, it's not a fun place to be, right? Carrying the burden of sin, uh, experiencing uh, the hardships and the consequences that come along with it, whether they be physical or uh, emotional or spiritual, uh, sin truly leads to some some rough, dark places. Uh, and so that leads to the question, what do we do? Do, do we just grin and bear it? Do we, do we ride it out? Uh, do we let heal or time heal? Uh, those wounds. Well, let's you know. Let's look tonight here in Psalm 38 at what David does, because David is dealing with that. He he's voicing here uh, the discipline that he is experiencing as a result of his sin, and and it's led to it's led to physical pain. It's led to abandonment from those who should be there for him in this time, and and it's led to ridicule. Uh, from his enemies, and so the question then is, where does David go? What does he do in the midst of this? Does he does he withdraw? Does he turn to earthly remedies? Uh, does he sulk? Does he try to work his way out of that sin? Uh, none of those work. Uh, none of those are what David seeks to do. Rather, he confesses his sin, and he waits on the Lord to deliver him. And that's what we're going to see here in Psalm uh, thirty-eight. You see. For the believer, and this is what David realized, this is what he understood, sin leads to God's discipline for the believer. Sin leads to God's discipline, which is different from his wrath. And and this discipline then comes uh, from a place of deep love, and, and its desired result, the desired result of this discipline, is not abandonment, but deliverance and growth. So what we're seeing here, we're going to see this progression of God's discipline coming in David's life because of his sin. And this discipline coming from this this place of love and faithfulness towards his children is going to ultimately lead David to correctly see who he is, what his sin is. It's going to correctly uh, allow him to have um, an evaluation of who he is. Uh, And then it's going to lead him to confession and ultimately deliverance. So it's important, I think, that we understand that distinction between um, rebuke and anger and and discipline 
and wrath. I think it's important for us to understand the difference uh, from the outset because, one, that's where David begins here in Psalm 38, and, and two, because this distinction, it gives us a correct understanding of God's reaction to a believer's sin and consequently the correct response uh, from the believer. So uh, it's very important that we get these this distinction cleared up at the beginning. So the psalm is, is what is known as a penitential psalm, uh, which speaks to repentance, a psalm of repentance. Uh, and, and this is different. Um, you may get this confused uh, with the practice of penance. This is not a penance psalm. Penance is this idea of doing something, of working in order to pay for your sins. Uh, this is That's not the gospel. The gospel tells us that someone else has paid for our sins. So there's nothing that we can do by way of penance or working that can pay for our sins. Rather, this is a penitential psalm. A penitential psalm, it, it speaks to repentance. And, and, and we're going to see that shortly when David you know, understands here uh, by the end that all he can do is call upon God uh, to act. And, and this tells us something else about the psalm. Uh, in that, as we see uh, in in the title of this psalm, it says a psalm of David to bring to remembrance. So this is a call to remembrance, and David is calling God to remember, which is actually another way of calling God to act on his behalf. So in short, David is in need of God's mercy, uh, which comes not from David's works of penance, uh, but in his being penitent or repentant, which is actually a work of God's grace as well. And this is needed for David. This is really needed for David because at the start of the song, at the start of this psalm, we are introduced to the fact that he is experiencing the rebuke and the discipline of God, which has ultimately led to his suffering. So we see this first in verses 1 through 8, this idea of fatherly uh, discipline. He says this, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me or discipline me in thy hot displeasure or anger. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand press me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, uh, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. So we see that in verses 1 through 8, that David is experiencing this, this rebuke, this discipline from God, and, and it's the result of sin, right? He says, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sins, uh, and he continues on because of my foolishness and my iniquities. So David understands uh, this idea that God hates sin. God is completely and utterly opposed to sin. And this is clear from David's cry. So sin rightly and justly prompts God's wrath and anger. And David understands this, and he doesn't disagree with God about it. Now, he doesn't shake his fist in the air and say, you know, why, God, why, why am I experiencing all of these things? He knows why he is suffering. And he says, there is no rest in my bones because of my sin. He says, my iniquities are gone over my head. Uh, these iniquities are too heavy for me. He says, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. So, so for David, his suffering here, those, those things that he is going through, it's not unjust. He isn't asking God to be exempt from God's proper response to sin. Rather, he's calling, calling for God to be merciful towards him in the midst of that discipline, in the midst of that anger, that righteous anger. He's calling God to be merciful towards him as one of his children. And Paul tells us in Romans 1 that God's wrath is continually poured out on, on unrepentant sins, on unrepentant sinners. But for those that have repented, those that have expressed faith in Christ, the good news of the gospel is that the wrath of our sins has been poured out on another. The wrath that would justly be applied to us in our unrepentant state 
has now been poured out on Jesus because of faith in his sacrifice and his work for us on the cross. Therefore, for David and for believers, God still hates the sin that remains in us, but instead of punishment, his children receive discipline and rebuke. And, and there's a difference there, and, and that is key. Whereas wrathful anger leads to death, uh, disciplining anger leads to life. It leads to deliverance. It leads to growth. doesn't mean it's not going to hurt in the process, but the, the desired outcome is different. And, and this is what any good father would do, right? So a, a good father, you know, when a child has done wrong, disciplines his child with the intent of deliverance from that type of behavior and its consequences with the intent of growing into a new direction, a, a new type of behavior. So, so flying off the handle and, and getting mad and angry and uh, with, with the child having no idea you know, what's going on or, or why they're being punished or uh, not understanding what the intent of this is or why uh, there is this feeling of anger. None of, none of these things, uh, none of that is going to lead to a, a good result. Right, but a good father who disciplines his child with the intent of that child being delivered and and growing, that is what a good father does. And the the author of Hebrews makes this really clear to us, uh, beginning in twelve, or chapter twelve of Hebrews, verses five through six. The author quotes Proverbs three eleven through twelve. And he says this, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. You see that? He says, don't disregard the discipline of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves. He, this, this discipline is actually a good thing. And, and David understands this. David is going to realize this as the psalm progresses. This discipline is a good thing. You know, certainly we don't want the wrath of God coming upon us. But as children, we understand that the wrath of God has been poured out on someone else, namely Christ Jesus. And, and what happens as those that have placed their faith in, in Him, what happens now in our sin is discipline. Discipline and rebuke with the intent of growing. The intent of sanctification. He continues on in verses 7 through 11. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all of you have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirit, uh, spirits in, life, in our life? Uh, for they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, you know, there's not a 100% a, um, a um, you know, perfect illustration between earthly fathers and a heavenly father. Right, earthly fathers are sinful in and of themselves, and, and so they don't always discipline correctly. Sometimes they do fly off the handle. Sometimes they're not there to to pick up the pieces and, and teach their children why they shouldn't do this or that. Why are they are being disciplined? There's no love sometimes after the anger and, and discipline. But this good father that we see that we have, uh, the heavenly father who is completely opposed to, to sin. Um, he disciplines his children rightly and justly with the intent of our being holy and growing in holiness. Now, David says, this is not fun. It's, it's painful rather than pleasant. Or the writer of Hebrews says this. It, it seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we all know that discipline isn't fun. Uh, it's painful emotionally, spiritually. And as David knows, sometimes it's painful uh, physically. Now, this doesn't mean that all physical ailments are a result of sin. I think about the blind man, the disciples, you know, why has this man been blind? Is it because of something that his parents did? And Jesus says, no, it's, it's rather for, uh, for the glory of God. And, and so 
you know, uh, what is going to happen to him is going to be for the glory of God. So we see that that, that f- physical ailment was not a result of sin, but it doesn't mean that this is never the case. I think Ananias and Sapphira, who died after, you know, lying to the Holy Spirit. So sometimes physical uh, suffering is a result of sin, even death. So discipline is never fun. Um, sometimes it results in emotional, spiritual, or even physical pain and consequences. But what we see in, in David's psalm and in the, the, the Hebrews is that it's necessary. It's necessary to lead us to a place of confession and repentance, which ultimately leads to a place of deliverance and growth, as we'll see in just a moment. So the father's reaction to sin prompts then, or should prompt, the correct response from the child. That certainly that's that's a result on an earthly level, but that's the result on uh, uh, on the heavenly father's level as well. When when the child understands that their father is disciplining them out of love rather than punishing them out of rage, then they're more likely to have a the, the correct response to their father's disciplining. So the discipline is now here in Psalm 38 is going to open David's eyes. This discipline that he's going through, the consequences of his sin, it's going to open his eyes. It's going to reveal to him what he already knows, uh, yet is so easy to forget, which is God's perfect knowledge, that, that he, he understands, that he sees our sin, all of our sin. Nothing is hidden from him. And, and this is this perfectly perfect fatherly knowledge that we see in verses 9 through 14. David says, Lord, all my desire is before thee. All my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panneth. My, my strength faileth me. As for the light of my eyes, it is also gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sword. My kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me. And they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and, and, and imagine deceits all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not. And I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. So what we see here in verses 9 through 11 is that David understands that the Lord is not unaware of his sin, nor his suffering. As he says, Lord, all my desires before thee, and all my groaning is not hid from thee. So all is laid bare here before the Father. And Wilcox writes this, and I think it, it speaks perfectly to what David is talking about here. He said that the, this fact that all is laid bare before the Father, he says this is the worst thing, and yet at the same time the best thing. Because once he accepts that neither his sighing nor anything else about him is hidden from the eye of God, the way is open for things to be put right. Again, discipline is not always fun, but it's necessary. right? So this everything being laid bare is at once the worst thing, but also the best thing. For David, everyone else has left him, right? Uh, he says, my lovers, my friends, they stand afar off. My kinsmen stand afar off. Uh, those that seek after my life, they lay snares for me. So we, we see that this abandonment of family, of friends, and uh, are apparently the consequences of his sin, uh, just as his physical ailments were. But even in the midst of all of the suffering, uh, in the midst of all of his suffering, which, which has come from God's discipline, God is still there. In the midst of all that, God is still there. And, and David knows that his plight, though, though ignored by family and friends and enemies, it's not ignored by God. Rather, his plight is, was given, his suffering, this discipline, it was given in order to wake him up, to make him realize who he is, uh, and, and certainly what his sin is in, in, in light of um, uh, of, of God. Uh, so in his commentary, uh, Wilcock records a quote from C.S. Lewis uh, from his book, The Problem of Pain, and he says this. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So the shouts there in, in David's pains are reflected in his physical and his social sufferings, but as Wilcock rightly concludes, he is quite prepared to accept that it comes from God. For its unpleasant but valuable effect is to strip away all posing and pretense and to expose him as he really is. This is what we need in our times of sin, right? To, to be stripped of, 
of our pride and our high evaluations of ourselves. And God's discipline has revealed to David who he really is. He's a sinful man in need of deliverance and growth. And this correct valuation then prompted from God's discipline, it leads David to the correct place. It leads him to confession and repentance. But but David can only do this because he understands, he first understands that, that God's discipline has come from a place of deep love. It's not that he has to do all these things in order to, to earn God's love and, and then he'll be delivered and, and all this. Rather, the discipline is a result uh, of the love that God already has for David, and this certainly leads him to be open to cry out and ask ask God, uh, make requests known, make his requests known to God even in the midst of sin and suffering. So we see this in verses 15 through 20. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me, for I am ready to halt. And my sorrow is continually before me, for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me are wrongfully, uh, wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries. So we see here in, in these verses, in verses 15 through 20, uh, we see this fatherly concern that that David knows that God has for him. And it's revealed in David's ability to, in the midst of his suffering and, and consequences of sin, still be able to make his que- his request made known to God. So David knows then that based upon his status as a child of God, he can come to God even in his worst times, even in his worst days. And, and the question for us and that, that we need to ask ourselves is, what do we do? In the midst of our sins and the consequences that follow from that, where do we turn? Where do we take our sorrow? And you know, in those moments, do we feel like we can make our requests made known to God? Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. But David did. David says this: "In Thee, O Lord, do I hope Thou will hear me, O Lord, my God." Apparently, what we see here is that his enemies are are harming him and saying all kinds of evil things against him. But instead of responding to them, instead of trying to, to, to fight against all these things that are going on in his life, he simply trusts God to uphold him and to answer him. And, and, and we may think, you know, it's, it's human for us to say, well, you know, isn't that kind of arrogant for David to, to you know, to say, you know, you know, God answer me, you know, in the midst of his sin, in the midst of the consequences of his sin. You know, we, we have this, th- this mentality of, well, what gives him the right, you know, to, to make requests in, in these times of, of great personal sin? Well, his faith gives him the right to do so. Uh, David, after assessing himself due to the discipline of God, he knows that he is incapable of delivering himself. And there, therefore, he must wait on the loving kindness and the mercy of God to deliver him. Uh, he, he simply has nowhere else to turn. And this is the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. David says, My sorrow is continually before me, for I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. This godly sorrow that, that, that believers are to experience should lead to confession and, and, and should lead to repentance. Whereas worldly sorrow simply leads to death, precisely because worldly sorrow does not lead to repentance. Worldly sorrow may produce sorrow for a little while, but, but it's not sorrow towards God, right? And, and ultimately leads to to no turning from that sin and, and turning to God. But uh, but uh, godly sorrow, as we see David experiencing, leads to confession and repentance. And Paul talks about this, uh, the difference here uh, between this, to the while he's writing a letter to the Corinthians. We see it in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 12. Paul's talking about this previous letter that he had already written to them, which, which had, had really caused them a lot of sorrow. And he says this, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that my letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved. And he says, I'm not, I'm not rejoicing because you were sorrowful, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief uh, 
produces death. And this is what David is experiencing. This, this godly sorrow uh, for his sin that is going to lead ultimately to repentance and, and his turning to God. So God's discipline has, has led David to this proper evaluation of himself, which has now led him to confess, led him to repent. And now he's in this place uh, where he was going to experience the Father's deliverance. And we see that in verses uh, 21 through 22. Forsake me not, O Lord, he says. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So having confessed and turned to God, David now cries out for remembrance, which as we know, this is a cry for God to act, right? To have mercy. So he says this, he says, Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So in this, we see three prayers and we see actually three names for God as we as we look at the um, as we look at the Hebrew. We see three names for God here. Uh, when he says uh, he's going to call on Yahweh, his covenant name, and he says this. He says, "Forsake me not, O Lord." And what we see here is this this word Yahweh. Forsake me not, Yahweh. So Yahweh here is the covenant name uh, uh, of God. The covenant name that was given to the God. Uh, 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 that there, that Israel was to use uh, for God, and David is calling on Yahweh here to do what He has promised to do, which is to be faithful to that covenant, to be faithful to His people, to not forsake His people. That was part of the covenant, right? That He would not forsake His people. Well, Wilcock writes this. He says the thought that such a one, Yahweh might forsake him is almost a contradiction in terms. For the covenant that Yahweh makes with his people is one of loving and unbreakable loyalty. And to forsake them is exactly what he cannot do. He continues by saying that the value of this prayer lies not in getting the Lord to do what I want, but in learning to want what the Lord is going to do. Wanting that deliverance, wanting that, uh, that, that, that godly sorrow to lead, that discipline to lead, to a place of deliverance and growth. Not, not coercing God into doing anything, which we actually can't, but in learning, as Wilcox says, to want what the Lord is going to do. Well, then he calls, on this second prayer, he calls God by his name Elohim, uh, which means that he is the one true, all-encompassing God. He, he is calling the God that is everywhere to not be far from him. And, and obviously God is close, but the purpose is for David to understand that and, and to reconcile this truth in his own life, that in his sin and, and even in confession and repentance in both, God is not far from him. And finally, he calls on God by his name Adonai, which means that he is a sovereign. He is the sovereign one, the master the ruler, and we see that when he says, make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. He's saying, Adonai, my salvation. Finally, he calls on God uh, by this name that means sovereign. And, and his call here is for this sovereign one to also be his savior, his deliverer. Wilcock writes this. He says, these brackets here, the, uh, this title of power, um, the psalmist brackets, uh, the title of power with the title of salvation, and he puts the gospel in a nutshell. He says, You know God's real greatness only when you have seen him bring all his power to bear on the saving of a world of sinners. So we see that bracket, right, between that title of power, Adonai, and this title of salvation, where he says, You are, you know, my salvation, my Lord, my salvation. So what we see here is that God's greatness in delivering sinners. And each call then, in these three prayers here at the end, each call is for God to remember. It's a call for God to act, to do what he has promised to do. And that is to save the repentant sinner, the one who has assessed himself rightly concerning his sin, and then turns to God with it, trusting that that salvation and deliverance and growth is found in him in him alone. Now, uh, tonight, you know, we would typically now have a time of prayer uh, together, but being online kind of hinders that. But each one of y'all still tonight have, have an opportunity to pray. Uh, and, and in a sense, we will still be praying together towards, towards the same end, right? Uh, 
Uh, so, so after I close um, in just a moment, I, I want you just, just to simply take a few moments to evaluate yourselves. Um, here at the end of the year, evaluate. Um, you know, do you see the Lord's discipline uh, in your life, or are you struggling with some sin, and you're like, I just don't want to. I don't want to bring this into the next year. You know, where are you taking your sorrow? You know, D- David tells us to confess it. He tells us to repent, and and he does so knowing that God is faithful and just to forgive. And this is what we read in 1 John 1, 9, and I'll close with this. The promise is this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So three concluding things. His discipline is a good thing in the life of a believer. It shows us, it reassures us that we are a child of his. Secondly, let it lead you to confession and repentance. And thirdly, know that the one to whom you pray is faithful to his children. So call on him tonight to act on your behalf. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us here from David. That it is so, it's so real. It's so, um, prevalent in our own lives what do we do with our sin God, we're so thankful that your word tells us that with our sin and our sufferings and our sorrow as your children we can turn to you so father help us to turn to you help us to call on you to act knowing that your discipline is for a purpose it grows out of your love for us and its intent is to move us onward to a place of holiness so, Father, help us not to wallow in pity. Help us not to, to sulk. Help us not to take our pain and sorrow and suffering and the consequences of sin to other places. Help us to take it to you, trusting and knowing that you are sovereign, that you are faithful, and that you are our Savior. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.